This is the Team Blaney Podcast. Welcome everyone to 2023 season episode 42 of the Team Blaney Podcast. My name is Adam Rogers and alongside me is co-host Steve Mez. As always, this podcast is brought to you by Fans for Fans. Steve and I have been following the drivers of the Blaney Racing family for two decades and Team Blaney itself launched on social media in 2014. Each weekly episode of the podcast offers an in-depth analysis of Ryan Blaney's latest NASCAR Cup Series race, plus news, notes, and a lineup of special guests all throughout the year. This week, Steve... Excited for this, we break down the number 12 team's run in the NASCAR Cup Series Championship race at Phoenix Raceway, and it's the first time we get to break down a championship race that Ryan Blaney was eligible for, raced in, competed in, battled in, and went out and won. Blaney looking for a championship. Chastain down the back stretch for the final time. Blaney is going to run in his tire tracks. You know, winning is in his family's DNA, and Ryan has just crested the mountain of all wins. Ryan Blaney is a NASCAR Cup Series champion. How about that, Steve? How what about that? Got, what else do we got to talk about? Uh, that's about it right there, huh? <laughs> I can't believe it. It was, um, what a, what a, what a year, <laughs> what an afternoon. Um, the afternoon was like a microcosm of the season, right? The ups and the downs and uh, ins and the outs. And you can feel the emotion go up and you can feel the, like the air coming out of a balloon again. And then all of a sudden by the end, uh, you know, everybody's hard work and determination and everything they could do and the focus, um, it just all came together uh, and at the right time. It's a great way to describe it. Um, I think going into it, we would have loved it if they just ran into the Phoenix, sat on the pole, led the most laps, ran away with that thing, won the race, all that stuff. But I mentioned in our Discord chat that was extremely lively the last few races, and especially this race, that nothing <laughs> that Ryan Blaney does, and I don't want to say it in a negative way, is easy. There's always some sort of drama behind it. There's always mm-hmm. grit. There's always, mm-hmm. like you said, determination overcoming obstacles um and i think that's just that's that's perfect for you know the family that he comes from the area that you know he was he was born into um just it's nothing comes easy and it, it almost of, makes it feel better degree of difficulty you know and and we're at a stage now in in the in the nascar series where it is so hard you know how many times do you actually watch a race where anybody just checks out like that anymore nobody does everybody seems to come back to the pack um, the arrow package and the things that happen with that and the way that everybody races each other. And they really are pretty equal. And um, to be that little step above or that little bit faster, um, that little bit better uh, control the car, you know, uh, on the edge when it's on the edge like that, um, we know what kind of con- car control he has. Um, it all just came together uh, in the last couple of weeks, like it needed to. And uh it was just just a beautiful, beautiful way to end. You know, like I said last week, he only had to beat three guys, just three. You know, we we're worried about everybody else, and uh, so that that statistic about the first time in the championship four era era where somebody else won the race, we're totally fine with that, and uh, I'm sure Ryan's totally fine with that because all he did was beat the three guys he needed to beat, and there was great drama racing for that too. You know. Uh, the the whole thing coming down to that restart with 30 something left and you know having to beat get to the two guys in front of him and get past them it was it was a awesome job of racing it showed off all his skill set and um you know it, it was a great way to go now something sounded really familiar that you just mentioned and that was the fact that um a really smart analyst out there at least a week ago predicted that Ryan Blaney would be the first driver in the championship four era to win the championship without winning the race. And I just got to give a big pat on the back to that guy because (laughs) super, super smart fan and, and, and analyst and Mm -hmm. podcast co-host, I think. Right. Don't hurt yourself trying to do that either. (laughs) (laughs) I did. And it came true. I think we we discussed last week though, that we maybe hoped it was going to be Harvick. That would be the one that won. And, um, it turned out a little bit different, but it did happen. It did happen. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah. You said, uh, I said Harvick right away. I think you, you brought up Denny Hamlin being a guy and Denny, uh, with yeah. a two tire strategy at one point kind of shows up near the front for a little while. Um, we really didn't see Chastain being that guy, but like, uh, you know, he did all the things he needed to do to, to stay where he was, you know, where he was going to be. So, um, you know, kudos to him for what he did, but, uh, just like um, we brought this up before the podcast, just like uh, when Dave won the uh, would be the nationwide race that he won back in the day um, that night, you know, Dave won the nationwide races, great drama. Cal Petty was on the call. Um, but when the race was over, they did a real brief interview with Dave and with, uh, with uh, Trent Owens, his crew chief. And then boom, they went right to Kevin Harvick because, Kevin Harvick won the nationwide series championship that night. He clinched it with whatever finish he had in the race. I don't even think he finished in the top five or 10, Mm -hmm. but he clinched it. And, you know, same thing yesterday. Uh, God bless you for winning the race, but I hate to say it. No one cares (laughs) because (laughs) you won a race that really had nothing to do with the championship. And the championship was won yesterday at the highest level and um uh, not just the nationwide or anything the high, highest level we have so you know congratulations on your trophy for you know i'm glad you got to smash a watermelon or whatever but uh the real trophy was on the back stretch last night after the race and uh there was only one guy taking pictures with it now one other prediction came true from this podcast and that was one of yours steve where basically since the beginning of the year maybe even the first episode of season three of the team Blaney podcast, you'd been preaching the fact that all Ryan Blaney needed to do was peak at the right moment. And you said this 12 team is capable at some point in the year and just going off on a run and winning multiple races and potentially making a deep playoff run. So you did say that I could go back and get the receipts. You definitely said that you said that at the beginning of the year, you said that when they won the Coke 600, you said that when they struggled over that summer stretch, that all they have to do is peak at the right time mm-hmm. and they could go out there and win the championship. Everybody throughout this playoffs is right advanced. They said, you do not want to see that 12 team get to the championship four in Phoenix because of what they did in the season finale last year, because of what they did in the spring race when he finished second to William Byron, because of what they did in the last two races there uh, where he finished fourth and fourth. So fourth, fourth, second, 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 once again, nobody wanted that 12 car in the championship four and they got there and they made them pay for it. Yeah. You know, the peaking at the, at the right time thing um, is a, is a blueprint that uh, Penske showed last year. You know, and uh, Joey Logano, he wins, he wins, what was it? He won Vegas in the round of eight, and then he went on to win the championship. Well, same thing for Ryan. Ryan won Talladega uh, to make sure he got into the round of eight. And then he, you know, he was going to point his way in Martinsville, but then he, what the heck, let's just go out and win Martinsville too while we're at it to make sure you're in the round of four. And once you've got that kind of momentum and you've got that kind of confidence in yourself, and the team's got that kind of confidence in themselves. Um, you know, Jonathan Hassler called really one of the most ma- marvelous races uh, as far as adjustments go. And that car at the end of the race did everything Ryan needed it to do to get past two guys at that point, uh, because we lost the 20 early on. And um, that's all, that's all she wrote. Ryan kind of actually acknowledges this in some of his post-race comments. And we're going to get to that a little bit later in the show. Uh, pretty extensively i've pulled all the audio i can just so we can have some fun here and listen to everybody's reactions to this championship victory but he said um you know in practice they he didn't think the car was necessarily that good but then you look at the speed chart and it's like oh it's pretty good he mentions that all throughout practice and then in qualifying no rear grip i have zero rear grip and uh looks at the speed charts and oh you know you qualified 15th it wasn't that great but get into the race all race long. I think even until the last run, uh, no rear grip. Um, the thing though, and he he mentioned it too, is you know realizing afterward that that was the exact same complaint every single oh, car in the mm-hmm. field, all four and mm-hmm. then three uh, championship mm-hmm. uh, eligible drivers complained about the same exact thing. So it's like he thought he had this terrible car that was running the fastest laps on the track 
most of the race uh, was one of the few cars that could catch people and pass people all race long in the positions that they had because of pit strategy or uh, one slow pit stop out of the entire day um, was able to be to, to make up track position even if they lost it a little bit so it was just mm -hmm. a little bit funny to me and i'm saying that to myself too i'm like he, he doesn't even realize how fast his car mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. and that everybody else is fighting the same condition but you're right jonathan kind of chased it all throughout the race and mm -hmm. um ended up with the perfect setup right at the end yeah the um was it racing analytics twitter uh put out the post where he you know he posts like the last 50 laps uh with their their median speed you know ryan ryan was the fastest one of the bunch um, it looked like, uh, you know, where they put him on the track, he puts him on the track there and he's got the five car, like half a turn away, you know? So, you know, a couple second win, uh, pretty easily there. Um, so yeah, if, if they ran in clean air, you know, with nobody in the way, that's, that's what it would have done. But, uh, yeah, it was just, uh, <clears throat> you know, you don't want to say dominating performance because, you know, there was so much up and down in the, in the, in the race itself, but in the end, when it really counted, um, Ryan showed off how talented a driver he is by pa making the passes he made and then keeping them, them guys. Actually, he started to gap them as, as the race, end of the race happened. And, uh, you know, it was, it was a beautiful thing to watch at the end. I definitely want to focus on the positive in this episode because there's just so much to celebrate, so many people to celebrate and thank for all their hard work and dedication. But I just want to have one real quick discussion on, on something that circulates pretty much almost every single year with this championship format. And this is the fact that you're going to get, you're going to see people on social media or um, maybe some drivers or former drivers and analysts kind of talking about um, this, the way we crown champions and what does it really mean anymore in this area, in this era where it comes down to one race and four drivers. Um, admittedly, I'm a stats guy and it really bugged me that Ryan fell below his career, you know, best totals when it came to top fives, top tens. Um, he was up a little bit in laps led. Um, actually, no. Yeah. So even laps led was down a little bit this year as well. So it's like across the board, statistically, wasn't necessarily Ryan's best season, but those three wins in the championship have to overshadow that. And does it bother you that they kind of had a, a okay season until it got to the second half of the year and then they go on this run and win the championship it it does not bother me those people don't bother me in my opinion we're going to talk about this you'll see those comments for the next couple weeks probably up until the ceremony and then when they roll into daytona he's going to have that fresh new fire suit with the championship patch on it now and uh he's going to get the respect of the garage and nobody's even going to think about the, the number of top fives he had this year, which was eight. The number of top tens he had this year was 18. Those three wins. And yet they fall, except for the win count, they fall just short of his career best totals. But he's got that big trophy that's going to go somewhere on a, on a mantle in his house that's going to tell a different story. I'm, I'm going to, you know, mention my wife, Kate, here because she brought this up um, last night. It's something she used on Twitter. It shut a couple people up. But this is the format they've they've now been given, okay? And it's um, it's not a stick and uh, ball sport type of thing, but it is in a way, you know, the way it's culminating with one last race. And she she brought up the twenty, I think it was the twenty eleven New York Giants, okay? The twenty and eleven New York Giants finished the regular season at nine and seven, made the playoffs, won their way to the Super Bowl. So they got hot, right? They got hot at the right time. They had to play an extra game or two because they didn't win the division, I don't believe. And then they won the Super Bowl. They beat a 13-3 and three New England Patriot team that was just steamrolling everybody all season long. So getting hot at the right time, getting yourself to the right situation, getting to the championship, and then making it happen. And it's a, it's the same thing we've seen. And this is the way this, the, the, the playoffs are built right now. So... Everybody can talk about, well, this guy was so great all year long. Well, that's great. But truthfully, the pressure was on in those last four races, right? The last, maybe even going into that, you know, like the Talladega win. Okay. So they win Talladega to make sure they're in those last four races, the last three races with a chance for the final race. The pressure was on everybody at that point, right? And what did the 12 team do? Where were their finishes? 
at Homestead or Vegas Homestead and then Martinsville, you know, running in the top five, even not even qualifying well, right? They didn't qualify well in a lot of those races, but by the end of the first stage, they're up in the top four or five, right? And then moving their way up and then leading the laps and then all of a sudden winning that final race and then getting themselves to the situation and performing in that situation. Whereas, you know, the 20 car blew up, you know, it literally blew up a rotor blew up on the 20 car. you know, is that the driver? Probably not. Is there something mechanical there? They might've tried to do maybe, but it was all about the pressure. Everybody had to perform under the pressure. And I said it like, you know, I always say it about putting the pressure on everybody else, right? Being, be the guy out front and make everybody chase you, you know, and down the stretch, that's really what the 12 team did. You know, they got themselves out front and made everybody else make the mistakes. Now, now does my prediction that came true bother you at all that he is, he is the first one to not, to not win the race and just celebrate the race win and the championship win all together. Is that, is that going to bug you at all, or is it the same thing? We, can I we ask roll you, the Daytona 500 next year, and we're we're good to go. Can, can I ask you a question? Who's sure. the tw- Who's the 2023 NASCAR champion? <laughs> uh, that is uh, young Ryan Blaney. Okay, that's I was like, we just want to make sure we got that part right. Um, <laughs> yeah, 2023 uh, NASCAR champion Ryan Blaney, correct? Okay, yeah, yeah, so they passed no, inspection no. and Does, they did not get inspection? disqualified. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Good. Good to know. Good to know that we uh, stayed up till 11 o'clock at night for that. Um, but yeah. Uh, yeah. So no, I don't fatter. I, I said it last week. I said, you have to beat three guys. And I told people, I don't care if you finish 20th and they finish 21st, 22nd, 23rd, 24th. I don't care. If you beat those three guys, you're champ. And that's, that's all that matters. You can, I hate to say it. You can have all the watermelon you want. Now, I feel like this might be a long episode just in general, just because I do want to get to all those sound bites yeah, that we're going to have later on. I could keep talking to you about this race for hours, but I do think we need to do our, our traditional race recap uh, because well, I know that's what the diehard fans oh are gosh. looking for. And we need to talk about that qualifying session that that concerned me a little bit if it wasn't for what happened at Martinsville and knowing that this 12 car was capable of driving up through the field. Yeah, this... um. This practice, uh, we're going to try and blow through this kind of quick. Because truthfully, a lot of it is really uh, worried about where the other three cars were during the race, too. Um, but, you know, championship practice here, they got like a 50-minute practice where everybody was out there at the same time. And they had a game plan of going out and doing a couple different runs. Um, within the first couple laps, he, he, third lap he ran, he was up to P1 for a little bit there. Um, then the eight car kind of took over. Um <clears throat> But eight laps in, he was P3 and less than a tenth back of the leader. Uh, they did 20 laps to start with. Uh, early on, the 10-lap average was uh, second best behind the 20, which, you know, once again, the 20 is, you know, we're looking at the the other three guys. What do they do? Um, they did 20 laps. They did a hot pen, hit hot pit entry. Um but he was one of the faster ones on the board there. He's P3 with a single lap. Uh, the 20 was P4. 24 was P7. The 5 was P8. Um, and the 2 and the 22 were actually out there focusing on qualifying runs. So this was something that, you know, what were his teammates doing? What were they trying to help with? Uh, 17 minutes in, uh, they went back on track there, you know. And uh, they were top 20 top they were top in 20 lap average you know which tells you right off that the, the the overall speed was pretty good there um they had to add a couple minutes to the practice because uh the 16 spun out um with 15 minutes to go they head back out for one more uh a bunch of laps here uh they were literally racing with the 24 on track i saw seven minutes to go and they were holding them off they were doing a good job actually uh, the five slapped the wall a little bit. Um, Jonathan says, go ahead and run as many as we can and then do a hot pin entry. You know, um, Brian says something about no security whatsoever. And I believe this is when Ryan scraped the wall. Yeah. I was just about to point that out that, yep. and they didn't fix it. They didn't fix it for the race. They left that uh-uh. little, 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 little ding in the fender. There. There. Yeah. Um, so with three minutes to go, he does bring it in here. They ran 63 laps overall. Um, the 20 did like a mock qualifying run. 
Um, now, here's the part that kind of irritates me that you're down the championship four and you're going to do this group A and group B, B thing now for qualifying, which splits up the championship four, two of them in this group, two of them in that group. Um, Ryan, I believe it was group B. So in group A, the four, the 24, 23, the five, and the 43 were the fastest. In group B, the one, the 11, the 17, the 45, and the 19 were the fastest. Ryan was p8 in his group um and he says right there he's in no rear grip um and the 20 was p7 in the group so that group overall was not good and I, like i said i don't know if going out second group made a difference track got hotter or slicker or got cooler well, i'm not sure which but um, yeah, especially for a team that had sat on the pole and what three or four of the playoff races something crazy like that though honestly yeah. i kind of wanted him to sit on the pole because they had not won from the pole at all they've kind of had some struggled a little bit and it's something about where set up for the race versus set up for uh you know qualifying and they do there they do make some adjustments or don't make some adjustments but not not totally all adjustments so there were a couple of things there too that may have been set up a certain way for a certain thing um, I guess there's a, it may be in one of your sound clips coming up in a little bit, but where Roger asked him about qualifying afterward and, you know, he looked, Ryan looked a little down and then Ryan said something about, well, I started P14 and in, going into the last stage at Martinsville and Roger, Roger said something about, well, that's all I needed to hear. You know, he knew he was ready. Um, so we're going to get to race day here uh, with uh, the, the 20, um, 20 was going to start P14 and the, uh, Ryan was going to start 15th here and you know, so 24 on the pole on the pole. Yeah. I'm sorry. And the five, and the was, five uh, is P four. Yeah. Um, so yeah, there <laughs> I had to flip the page uh, stages of 60, 185, 312 here, fuel situation about 92 to hundred laps uh, pit stall 38 open in front three behind. This was the kind of cool thing, even though they qualified where they did, the championship four guys were given preference in the order they they did qualify. So sure he was the fourth best, but he got of, of the championship four, but he got to pick fourth overall. Um so he got and that, open the 24 cars in that number one pit stall, which mm -hmm. at Phoenix is a big deal, especially mm -hmm. going all the way back to um 2021 when Larson won his his uh, championship because they got out first and you know, even Byron ever almost every pit sequence here gains on everybody too so it did mean a lot to sit on the pole and get that uh stall but obviously that we know um that didn't matter too much didn't win him the championship though no um yeah how about that um the uh kind of interesting here with something a little no side note i found out the so the five and the 20 both pick pit stalls where they have an open out okay but behind them behind the five is the 22 and behind the 20 was the 21 now Pinning behind a guy, unless you come in before he does, you're really not going to affect him much because he's still going to, if he pulls yeah. in before you, you know, but if you get to a situation in the race where you're running a spot or two ahead of that guy and he's got to come in and around you and you go a little deep in your box and he has to angle in differently, it could affect him a little bit. But like so I said, they, they, the those wingmen new, getting into position, it could have been in <laughs> position, but Neither of them really ran up there with those guys at all to actually cause that. So um, Roger gets on the radio and says, let's go here. And uh, Ryan says, let's go win a championship. And uh, once they get to the start here, that sorts out to P16 early on, you know, the mayhem that happens on these restarts is awesome to watch. Uh, at lap seven, he's behind the 99 here. Lap eight passes the 99. And the eight does a twofer. Um get to 14th and says he needs more rear grip um, lap 14. He's behind the 20. So he got up to him and then uh, Ryan says two numbers of grip. <laughs> he wants kind of a swing here, but, uh, but lap 30, he passes uh, the 41 gets to 13th and then he's working on uh, the higher line on both ends here. So uh, during the race, uh, like uh, I watch in car camera and he definitely did a lot of different things to see if he could run high and run low and what kind of lap times they were getting out of it. And uh, it was amazing actually, because the early part of the race, that's what they're doing. But later in the race, he pretty much can do anything. Um, 
Lap 36, we're passing the 54 to get to 12th. We're chasing the 45 now. Lap 42 passes the 45 to 11th. Now running behind the 11th. Lap 52 passes the 11th, gets a 10th. Um, and at lap 55, I noticed on lap times that Ryan's faster than the other three guys. Uh, so once he catches up to them, uh, lap 60 here, the 24 does win the stage. Uh, the five finished fifth, the 20 finishes ninth, and Ryan finishes 10th. And um, talks about no rear grip, uh, similar problem at both ends. Uh, Jonathan's talking about tightening up at least one number change. He doesn't want to go too far yeah. because he's, you know, they want to build, if they're going to build anything, build, you know, loose, not tight. Um, Slow pitting. and methodical uh, march forward there. I mean, it wasn't like yeah. as fast as he got to the front at Martinsville, but it was enough. I was like, okay, five positions in the first stage. That, I think that works out pretty well. There's a long race to go. Um, but yeah, I, I was, I was satisfied. I wasn't excited, yeah. but I was satisfied with that movement. Well, um, like we said, stage points didn't matter, you know, and we're, we're all, all we're looking at is just trying to move up by the end of the race. So uh, pinning in 10th, coming out eighth, uh, I've got like, I've got a 9.7 stop here. And, you know, some of the other guys said a 10.3, a 9.9 and a 10.0. So, um, you know, he gained a couple of spots on a couple of guys just on, on their pit stop. Uh, Roger, Roger does get on the radio and tell good job, everyone. Um, and then he tells Ryan, everyone was having problems on the track. So he kind of wa- comes in and when he does come in, he comes in as the voice of reason a little bit. Yeah. Uh, you know, Ryan's not going to argue with him on the radio or anything, you know, but he gives you information that, um, you probably needed to hear. You probably needed to hear, you know, you're not the only one out there, you know, and everybody else is having issues too. And you're doing a good job with what you've got, you know? That's kind of uh, John, what I said in early our early conversation was that he mentions all race long about this rear grip issue. And it's like literally every single car is having this problem. Having, it's not, it's yeah. not just you. Yeah. Jonathan said he did a little bit of a wedge and air adjust, adjustment here. Um, on the restart here, 24 takes the bottom, Ryan takes the top and um, you know, they, they start out uh, which he's actually in a spot in front of the 20 and ninth there. The 20 was ninth and uh 24 was leading and the five was fourth. So the restart lap 69, it gets up to six on this restart lap 71 passes the 23 up to fifth, uh, lap 88, uh, the 20 does pass him. He's back to sixth here. And, you know, uh, talks about that. He's running behind the five at one point and the five is doing some air blocking on him. Um, this is the know, beginning right? of the, what we can describe as the, the sassiness or the, mm-hmm. He's a little bit short. I mean, that, unfortunately, in this race and then even in the the descriptions of it after and some columns that were written, like people really want to focus on Ryan getting heated behind the wheel. And we'll talk about this a little bit more when we get to the Chastain part. Mm-hmm. Um, but this is for all those of us that have followed him his whole career, especially the last three or four years like this is nothing new. It's kind of part of his process. He's got he's got enough people around him to get over to uh, to get over it and focus it in the focus that energy forward in a different direction. But yeah, this is, this was a kind of the start of it and it, it, it makes for some good TV <laughs> TV yeah. well, audio well, and clips after well, though. Well, that's the thing. Now TV is concentrating on four people, correct. And they love going to the radio for this, but the truth is, is listen to the other 30 some radios uh, every week. And you're going to hear this out of half the guys, you know, he's not the only one that gets frustrated or gets uh, vocalizes his frustration. Um, as long as they're doing it with the vocal part and not doing it with the car, you know, and, and he's not the only one. That's the part that amazes me about uh, how all these stories are written or all these questions are asked and they talk about tempers. Um, there's a lot of guys that have tempers, as we're going to see later on. There are a lot of guys that like to show you that, that they have a temper, you know. Um, so, you know, lap 95 here, the, the five is now blocking the 20. <laughs> At lap 96, uh, Ryan does a twofer. He passes the 20 and the five gets up to fourth by going down awesome. on the dog leg, right? He, <laughs> Scary. He just, he just cuts Scary. a Scary. Cuts uh, a will say down the... the dog leg, and then he gets down to turn one, and he's below and underneath, and then cuts them both off. But the 20 absolutely cuts Ryan a break mm-hmm. in this move, though. And I think it's because they knew they had, they had more time to battle here. But the, if the 20 doesn't lift here, 
Ryan might might have taken out both of them, but both hey, who it made for a great moment, and mm-hmm. um, you could tell. So I was talking about Ryan focusing that that energy and that frustration, and he focused it all the way into one heck of a move that that got him mm-hmm. all the way up to the up toward the front. And like I said, oh, that slow m- methodical march forward. We get to that second stage; it's like a rocket ship to mm-hmm. the front. Yeah, lap one hundred here. Um, Josh tells him that him and the one are the the best ones out there right now. And um, Ryan says, we still need more rear grip. Um, at lap 103, we're gaining on the 24. And, you know, Roger gets on the radio and tells him, you're better than him. Just take your time. Um, at lap 107, he passes the 24, gets to third. Um, I think Roger comes on here and says, take care of the of the car and the tires, you know. Uh, lap uh, 109, we get a caution for the 20, blowing the rotor. And... Um, yeah, this was a weird situation. You had a little theory on this. Um, you're just kind of guessing about setups. That, yeah, uh, I mean, a, a lot of people have mentioned that, oh, you know, oh, it's unfortunate. Bell gets knocked out by a random mechanical failure um, with this next gen car. And I know they've made changes over the last couple of years as we as we've run it. But there's been multiple times at, at a couple of specific tracks where teams have kind of pushed the limits on their brake package. And they do have some options when it comes to brake packages in the way that they cool their brakes. And if you get aggressive, there's a possibility that you're going to cook them basically and the rotor can fail. So I, my theory is that they, the 20, you know, honestly out of the championship four was probably the fourth seed um, they were kind of running under the radar. They thought maybe they could use that to their advantage and go and steal the championship. But I think that also pressured them into putting in a very aggressive setup that included brakes. And unfortunately it, it bit them. Now I could be totally wrong. I'm not a mechanic. I don't know all the things, but I paid attention enough this year in the last couple of years that when we've had brake rotor failures, it's mostly been a team issue and their aggressiveness when it comes to the, the setup and the cooling and, and all those all those things that go into a brake package. So um, on the plus side now, we are only, by we, the 12 team is only going to be battling two other drivers now instead of three. And we just saw over a long run, the 24 and the five fade and the 12 move forward. And my um, optimism was pegged at mm-hmm. this moment because I said, if this could play out like we said last week in our preview of this race, long green flag runs it's going to work out just like it did at martinsville he's going to methodically get to the front and he's going to win the championship and we're seeing that kind of play in front of our eyes and it was really really rewarding at that point in the race (laughs) to see one other thing i wanted to mention um i don't know if it was at this point but it was kind of around this point in the race that jeff gluck kind of puts a tweet out that says can we please go back to Homestead or can we please move the championship race somewhere else? Because outside of, um, and it might've been even after this a little bit longer, like people kind of were seeing the typical Phoenix race that we've seen the last few years where outside of the restarts, it's not super exciting, even though we're watching the 12 car pass people. And I don't know how people don't notice that, especially with the coverage they had on TV, but it's still that typical too hard to pass. Nobody's passing. Um, But in my opinion, people are passing, Ryan's passing people, the good cars are passing people. And you mentioned from watching the in car, guys are trying all different lanes. So Mm -hmm. maybe it's, I don't don't know, maybe I'm going to be totally biased biased on this race just because of the outcome. So maybe that has tinted my glasses a little bit rosier. Mm -hmm. And um, the finish of this race, I think, saves it, though, still based on the poll that he had. Uh, on Monday, it still wasn't seemed to be super widely loved yeah. by fans. But Which I don't know what were your thoughts on the racing. That. I was surprised about that too because you know the the winner is very extremely popular. You know, so usually the polls affected by the winner too, and or the championship winner at least. You know, so. But yeah, I think they need to go to Homestead. <laughs> go back to Homestead. Um, the arrow package the way it is right now, unless they can figure something out between now and next year. Um, that totally changes it. Uh, there was just so much air blocking type type racing here, whereas at least on some of the mile and a halfs now, uh, they still do a little bit of it on some of the mile and a half. But really, truthfully, if you can get a, a mile and a half like Homestead was run, where it widens out into a couple lanes and they have to come together uh, coming off the corner off different lanes and somebody gets more momentum. Um, yeah, you see a lot less of that because you see somebody actually make a nice momentum pass, you know. 
off of running a couple good laps in a row. I'd love Homestead. I, I, I'd love to see it. I love it in general. What I can tell you from attending two championship races at Homestead and multiple um, just standard playoff races, and even in that that's one, uh, one-off spring race that they did at one point there, racing is great. The fan attendance is not great. Even yeah. when I saw I saw Jimmy Johnson win his last championship there, I saw Kyle Busch win his second championship there. That one actually had a little bit more people there than the Jimmy title run did. Um, but it just, I don't, I don't know if it's because it's, I mean, it is kind of out in the middle of nowhere. It is very close to Miami though. So it has that going for it, but the racing is great. I think the facility is pretty good. It's not as good as what looks like they have out there at Phoenix. And um, it seats more people, I'm pretty sure than Phoenix. So that's one thing Phoenix has when they talk about it selling out all the time. It mm-hmm. doesn't really actually have that big of a capacity. So I understand why they're in the Phoenix market. It sells out. It looks great. The facility, they put a ton of money into it racing maybe would be better at homestead though i would say you know ryan finished second in this homestead race you know a few races ago it wasn't necessarily a barn burner of a race and the 20 kind of drove off with it at the end so but it's it was probably overall better it's just does nascar care do they care one and do they care about attendance or do they just care about the on-track product product or do they want to be in you know phoenix is a, a you know, as far as bowl games and some other things, it's pretty big championship town. And mm-hmm. I, I understand why they're there, but who knows? That's a, that's a conversation for another day. I just don't think they're, <laughs> there's only a, there's a few tracks that NASCAR can even go to because they don't want to give the championship race to SMI. <laughs> so you really only have Phoenix Homestead and maybe one or two others that they can go out there right now based on the, on the climate and temperature. So, but anyway, I just yeah. thought it was interesting the way Gluck, I think he even mentioned it in their, you know, teardown podcast that he felt like an idiot after he posted that. And then the way that the strategies change and the drama mm-hmm. totally changes with the racing yeah. that we're going to talk about. So I know I'm going off track, but it was an interesting tidbit that, that happened in the middle of this thing when it seemed really boring, but after this caution, things are about to pick up. Yeah. I, I'm glad you kind of did that. Cause it kind of, you know, we don't want to really talk about the next set of pit stops anyway. So you mentioned that this race kind of being a microcosm of the season, and we haven't shied away from the struggles that Ryan has had at times, the struggles they've had at strategy sometimes, the struggles they've had on pit road at some times. We're, we're not, we don't sugarcoat it. We try to present the facts to you mm-hmm. of what happens. And the fact is, this is a high level sport. Mm-hmm high level motorsports there is a easily small errors can cost you when you're Mm -hmm. trying to do a pit stop in 10 seconds and under and unfortunately this specific set of pit stops we do have a have a a little bit of a struggle yeah and it's not just him either because i mean the five car does a 10.4 okay and ryan does an 11 one which is a little you know about a second more than they really want to be um, so they come in third and they go out seventh. Um, but once again, you know, this is one of those things where you take a deep breath, you know, um, Josh always says, get a drink, drink of water, get a drink, get a drink. And I think yeah. that's part of like a, a thing where they just kind of reset. Um, still early leader, too. Yeah. The leader is the four taking the bottom. Um, and Ryan in seventh takes the top here and the restart lap one seventeen, settles into seventh right behind the five car, you know, at lap one twenty, the one does take the lead away. Uh, but lap 130, uh, the trying a bunch of different lines, both ends, about two to three tenths back of the five car, you know, lap 136, uh, the 19 passes the 24. So now we got, the, you know, the 24 is in fifth, um, the five is in sixth, you know, Ryan's in seventh, you know, they're all right there, all within, you know, a second of each other, the three cars, you know, um, lap 152, we pass the five, get to sixth, um, uh, Roger gets on, says, good job there. Take your time. Um, Ryan says, I just need silence. Uh, now, this is after something, actually after something Josh said, not after Roger. Uh, Josh was giving him, I think, the line of, the, of one of the guys behind him. And uh, Ryan just what kind of wanted to concentrate at this point. Um, at lap 160, he's closing on the 24. At lap 172, the 17 actually took the lead. Ryan was four-tenths back of the 24. Lap 178, um, the 24 and the 19 are racing in front of Ryan. And, um, you know, uh, 
the 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 last lap of the stage here the 17 wins the stage the 24 finishes fourth the 12 finishes sixth and the five finishes seventh so here we go going into into the into the final stage they're running right next to each other uh ryan's kind of says i don't know how i got that loose um they're pinning in going in sixth they come out fifth okay so uh, I, uh, the pit times don't weren't showing up on the tv at this point and uh, i could go back in and dig them up but they're all within you know how quickly things change yeah. you know yeah, they so... totally you know go from a, a little bit of a low there a little bit of a stumble on that last pit stop mm-hmm. uh, but this is a very resilient 12 pit crew mm-hmm. um, a lot of passion a lot of heart talented guys that are are good enough to put out good pit stops and great pit stops every once in a while and i honestly something denny hamlin said about his pit crew throughout the year all he wants them to do is just keep him in it plus that's one it. minus one that's okay you know he doesn't want to have like what the 12 team had the previous stop but that's all i was looking for was just st- solid stops and we kind of get that the rest of the mm-hmm. day and that was thankfully that's the way it happened and it was great to see them bounce back and gain a spot in the sequence yeah uh the one's the leader taking the bottom ryan takes the bottom from fifth here um the 24 is p2 and the five is p4 so you know everybody uh did really well in their pit stops they all kind of moved up a little bit uh restart lap 193 here they sort out the fourth here passing the five car uh lap 200 um the 24 is in second ryan's in fourth and the five cars in fifth uh the 19 is the car running in third in there in between uh, lap 207 we pass the 19 to get to third at lap 211 we pass the 24 to get to second lap 217 closing on the leader uh, josh gets on there tells him we're the fastest car here uh, lap 227 uh, <laughs> ryan says i hope he's proud of himself <laughs> and i think this is in reference to the way that he's blocking him uh you know doing this arrow block thing uh lap two and this is the one car the one car you're talking about right yeah Yeah. the one car i'm sorry yeah um the lap 230 um they tell them we're about 10 or 15 away from pitting here uh but at lap 240 they pit so what happened is the five and the 24 actually hit pit road the lap before and uh jonathan brings them in to kind of match that and uh you know lap 243 here uh ryan actually asked did they pit and they tell him yes it was the lap before um but it kind of all sorts out by lap 253 they sort out to p2 behind the one car again and this is the green flag pit stop i we had kind of discussed this earlier the green flag pit stop happens and they cycle out they cycle out in front of them like they they should and they've actually starting to gap them a little bit here too which they should and pretty much from here on out you know should be you know, as we, long as the state stays green, the only thing I love just want green. a long run. That's All it. we it's want is a long stay, run to the end. Go home with the championship, cruise to victory. That's it. Stay green. Worst case scenario is is a caution coming out. Yeah. So, it, uh, you know, uh, Josh gets on there, and says, "Hey, let's go get the one and get the win." Uh, lap two fifty eight here. We're messing with the one in the nineteen. Um, you know, and this is that part where he bumped him. You know, and he bumped him. And what's bad about it is, you know, you don't want to mess up your race. You know, you're racing the other two guys. You're not even racing the one. You're racing the other two guys that are still in it. And you're ahead of them. Don't mess up your race. But on the other hand, he bumped them just right to make the pass on him. What he didn't count on is the 19 putting his nose up there and made him three wide. And now you don't want to be in the middle of three on this track trying to pass either of those guys um you know what so are your I, what are your thoughts i just want to just briefly chat and i think in the the previous sequence we talked about ryan um losing his cool a little bit on the radio you know during this battle with the one he's really animated in the car he may or may not flip a bird at one point yeah. he bumps the one but he's also had an issue with the 19 i think under the previous caution he'd bump the 19 under caution um this is the first race that I can remember in this championship four era where, and I don't think it was just Ryan. It was even the five and the 24. They were being raced extremely hard by their competitors. Whereas in years past, and I'm not saying this is right. And this is what they should have done, but in years past, they have been given an extreme amount of space to race for the championship. And it just seemed like this year, everybody was like, 
no, we're we're not going to do that. Yeah, it, um, it's kind of amazing because there's no written rule that says they have to back off. There's no written rule that says you just, you know, but they do tell them you don't want to affect the championship. And this is the part that, you know, people get in arguments about on Twitter and, and everything about, about Chastain air blocking and Ryan, you know, saying what he says later on about it. And what those people understand are not understanding is Ryan was faster than the one. The one was doing things to not let him buy. And in the meantime, the five car and the 19 actually, because the 19 was right behind them, but the, he was by doing all this, causing all those cars to catch up with him, you know, with the one car. And it's, I don't want to use the word dumb, but it's dumb because sooner or later, all those guys are going to be up there ganged up on you because they were all faster than you. You know, the statistical thing that they do, like I said, the racing analytics thing shows you that he was the fifth fastest of all those guys. The one car was, he was holding them off based on the fact that that's the style of racing that, you know, that they're kind of trapped in with this car, but you're going to hurt the championship by doing this also, because now you've made it where all the championship guys are up your butt and racing each other. And they shouldn't have been, um, if you let the you know, 12 by and probably the 19 too, because the 19 was better than you. And then the five comes up and the five passes you because he's better than you. I know you don't win your race, but you don't affect the championship either. You let the guys who are racing for a championship race, race, you know, literally race. Um, those guys, the three of them that were still in it raced each other quite cleanly for the most part. They may have bumped into each other a little bit here and there on a restart or two, but they did not do a lot of this arrow blocking that the one was doing. Um, they passed somebody and they made their pass. They made their move. They got around them, you know? So was there a point at all where, so this was my thoughts was at first I'm yelling at Ross in my living room at the TV for doing what he's doing. But then I quickly switched to like, not yelling at Ryan, but I'm like, just concede here. Just mm -hmm. run second, you know, run right on this guy's bumper the rest of the way and win the championship. Because if you keep doing this, as you said, the 19 closes in, the five closes in, everybody closes in when these guys get battling side by side. So yeah. any point, and I think the team's even telling Ryan, like, you don't have to win to win the championship. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I, I feel like I was in that zone too. I'm like, just back yeah. off, just please. Well, well, I guess what like I was about to say here at lap 261, Ryan asks them to keep him updated on the five. Um, and he moved back to third. So what he did is he let the 19 go because the 19 had made that move, made it real dangerous. And Ryan got smart about not wrecking his car just to race those guys. And um, they got, you know, they kind of got spread out again. And, you know, lap 267, you know, he's got almost two second lead on, on the five still with 45 to go. And at lap 269, he passes the 19 again to get the second. So he let everything cool off. He got it back together. And then he started going back to the front again, you know, because he was faster than these guys. And um, in the next couple laps, he does actually pass Chastain. He does not block him. He could have really blocked him, but then again, Chastain, the way he was running, might have knocked him out of the way. So he had to be careful of that danger. Um, Chastain pulls off a move where he kind of like cross crosses over and gets it back, which is great racing that in that manner. Um, and then the caution actually comes out at lap two seventy five for the eight car. So this caution absolute here, worst case scenario, totally because if you let it go he's going to get to the one and pass the one at some point again, he'll get patient. He'll back off for a little bit, cool it down again, but he'll get by him. And he'd already put the 19 between him and the five, which is perfect. You know, the more cars you put between you and your competitors, they got to pass them. That's great. Um, so if it stays green here, I think we're, you know, looking at probably winning the race too, because I I think he would have got to the one finally in the next, you know, whatever and, laps. And in this sequence that you're about to read off, the worst case scenario plays out too. And I mentioned it again, I'm 100% behind the 12 pit crew, but I do think when they're going heads up 
and the heads up with again an elite driver like Kyle Larson too because you'll you will hopefully mention this as well there's more than just the pit stop that goes into mm-hmm. the sequence mm-hmm. but you're going up against an elite driver, a championship winning driver and crew in Kyle Larson. You're going up against the 24 and William Byron who has the number one pit stall that they said was a, a few tenths would gain them a few tenths on every pit stop. So yeah, I'm like, okay, oh, the worst case scenario, Ryan is going to come out behind at least one of these guys, possibly two and Chastain's already out front and the one, one pit crew all last year and much for much of this year, really, really awesome pit crew. So I, I thought, I thought this was my fault. I was so excited. I thought Ryan's battle with Chastain was also my fault for being way too, um, way too excited about the the prospect of Ryan winning a championship. I already had my social media posts running through my head. What am I going to post at the end of this? You know, how many pictures mm-hmm. can I, can I, you know, collect and you know, how awesome is this going to be? And I felt like I was being punished uh, because <laughs> this, this caution comes out and jinxes yeah. things. And you know that I'm a little bit superstitious. So mm-hmm. I was, yeah. I was a little bit down on myself. I'm watching the worst case scenario play out. And then now let us tell us what happens on these pit stops. Cause it's not yeah. even them. There's just some other strategies that, yeah, that's, that, that's... that happen during this part that's the funny part is the tv did a really good job of explaining this and um they usually don't they usually just show you the time you know this you know uh but they show the running time they show how long these cars are on pit road and okay so the 12's pit stop time was actually nine nine it was sub 10 pretty good the five car nine five so four tenths faster really good but they show you the running time down pit road and um, the five car was like six or seven tenths faster on that. And that just means that he was able to hit his lights better or maybe not be quite as conservative. Uh, I don't know which, because, you know, pitting on this pit road is dangerous because they've got to bend it at the, at the one end and you have yeah. to ch- change lights in the different segments going around the bend. Um, and, and that, can affect you know what your speed is like and literally ryan they always run that um down pit road before the race and you know for 10 15 seconds afterward jonathan will get on and tell him you did this you did that or it looks good or you can do that all day uh, but there was a segment you know down near the uh you know the turns one and two where he said something to him about something and ryan says yeah i was a little over the light i was trying to adjust it and so he may have been more conservative just based on that, not wanting to get a penalty. And, and much like Homestead, same thing. Like, absolutely, he does not want to throw a championship away because he speeds on pit road. Pit road they so. did. There was 30 laps to go. Maybe he can get back to the front in some miracle. But on the other hand, the five and the 24, I don't want to say they have nothing to lose. But if anybody's going to be aggressive on this pit stop, as far as mm-hmm. pushing the limits on their lights, it's going to be them. And the yeah. five said in his post-race interview that he thought he was the best on his lights all day long. And that showed in that graphic that they put up there that said his rolling speed was much better than the rest of the field here. So start yeah. a little bit behind on this restart. And um, yeah. man, we I was that, I was nervous. We get, we get the 11 and the 43 taking two tires in here, too. So that totally kind of jacks up everything you know so really because it's he goes in but second comes out six but technically he would have come out fourth so he only would have lost a spot or two and it would have been to those two guys though um so the 11's the leader taking the bottom ryan taking the top and this makes the restart really hairy because the two tire thing is quite the gamble and realistically it's it's not going to work within two or three laps it doesn't work and uh, they restart lap 280 um five and the 24 are on the bottom here and really early on ryan's racing the 24 passing the 11 passing the 24 and he gets right behind the five within the first lap or two scary just, moment though just, when he's passing the 24 mm-hmm. this got really aggressive 24 is wrapping the bottom ryan tries to pinch him down as far as he possibly can they're making slight contact and i'm thinking just a little bit more of a nudge and ryan's going around and honestly i think the 24 would be driving right into his door so mm-hmm. Oh man, that was so scary. But the fact that he was able to get past the 24 here so quickly Quickly. was a pivotal moment in this championship victory right here, because if he had to spend more time passing the 24 and then getting to the five and having to spend all that time, you know, there's only 30 something laps to go. I mean, the time was running out. Yeah. Um, You know, lap 285 is P3 behind the five lap 290. He's running right next to the five here. 
And lap 292, he passes the five, gets to gets to P2 with the one leading. And great battle. Um, it was. It was side by side. Um, you weren't going to complete the lap uh the pass in a lap. Sometimes it you ran side by side for two or three laps. And Ryan um drove to the outside on him and got got outside on him and, and did some scary moment. Oh yeah, they kind of ran into each other. The five, bit. uh they yeah, I think they may be a little bit slight contact, but also the five goes to uh I think go down into the apron and nearly spins out and yeah. Ryan's pretty confident that if the five spins out here, he, he was going to co- get collected into turn two with this. So freaked me out, but also that's what, that's actually what made Ryan make the pass. And I think in the next turn. So, I mean, back again here, here, I'm Mr. Confidence again after that, but it took a little while though. The five hung mm-hmm. with Ryan. He got mm-hmm. to his bumper two or three yeah. more times before he eventually yeah. checked out, but it was, yeah. It was it was enough to where I was thinking, man, if that caution had come out with 15 to go or 10 to go, the five probably would have raced even more aggressively and could have been some trouble. Really, really great here because Josh, this is where Josh comes comes uh you know comes into play here because he's giving him uh you know, Ryan is watching the mirror to some extent, but Josh is telling him exactly where the five ran in the corner and did this and did that. And letting Ryan know that he's clear coming out of the corner, and for that next uh, from lap two ninety two to to three oh two, that that's exactly what you're talking about. Like uh, where he kind of gains on it a little bit and then loses it on exit, gains into the corner, loses it on exit. So it looks a little closer for a little bit, and then Ryan spreads it back out, and Ryan just starts clicking off these consistent, really really good laps, running the line he wants to run, not worrying about where the five is. And by lap 302, he's got him. Josh says you're up by 10, you know, which is a couple tenths by that point. And uh, that is my last note that I actually took for the rest of the race. The next 10 laps, uh, basically, is, you know, uh, watch the TV. <laughs> you're in a glass case of emotion at that point, right? We were standing. Uh, we both stood up. We both, you know, put, I had Josh's thing on, on my phone, listening to him, put it up to our ears and then just watch the rest from there. And, uh, you know, got to those exciting, that exciting finish, you know, brought to you by credit one or whatever. <laughs> and so uh, what were yeah. describe your, um, I mean, we might mention this too, when we talk about what Ryan's thoughts were. And I, I, my wife was a little bit confused with my reaction because I was, I was much more subdued. Um, I will mention that, you know, and you, you know, comfortable saying some tears were shed much like there was a little bit last week at Martinsville as well. But I felt like I got all of my ecstatic jumping up and down, shouting, screaming, cheering out at Martinsville. And when he he wins the championship here, she kind of described it as I was just taking it all in. And I kind of felt that's how I, that's how I was. That was my initial reaction. Um, I wasn't on my feet. I was at, on the edge of my seat hope not hoping for assuming the worst was going to happen and there was going to be one more restart because like the 15 you know blows a tire and goes into or somebody's somebody you know we just made that pit stop somebody's wheel goes flying off like something crazy i was even worried that it would be like the two or the 22 like the the 22 would actually spin accidentally spin somebody like it was just gonna and it would be self-inflicted on the team but that didn't happen ryan blaney pulls away because he had the best car you know, the best driver on, at, at this track uh, go out and win this race. And and Steve, I have to say one of the things that made this victory championship victory, unfortunately doesn't win the race. So special is that he faced adversity on that final pit stop because yeah. they're just slightly slower with their stop and their rolling time. A couple of guys take two tires. So they lose track position. And I think I texted you that this is in the driver's hands now and Ryan Blaney who has been criticized in the past for not being able to close out races for not being able to rise to the occasion went toe to toe with Kyle Larson, who is, I would say undoubtedly most likely one of the absolute best drivers of a race car on this planet went toe to toe with Kyle Larson, a champion in this series and beat him and took the championship away from everybody's favorite drivers. Yes. You know, um, this, uh, you know, we, we were on our feet and, you know, we kind of grab each other 
And then I start to just think about watching the celebration and watching the different people, um, you know, because we got to see faces that we've gotten to know from doing this in the last couple of years. And um, just, you know, basically wanted to give all those guys all the credit in the world. Uh, you know, Ryan, Ryan's behind the wheel, Ryan executes, um, but team 12 and, you know, uh, Jonathan calls them team, team period, 12 period. If you ever look, there's actually a period at the end of each one. Um, and those are, those are those guys that put together uh, everything that uh, they could to make sure that car did that at the end, you know, and uh, it, it just so great to see all those guys just getting hugging each other, jumping up and down, you know, that's all. I mean, you're right. That's all I was looking for in that celebration. I'm seeing Tony Palmer. I'm seeing Raymond, seeing Dave Nichols, seeing mm-hmm. Josh Williams, seeing Chris Conklin, all these guys that have, and, and more that have, have given their time to us just to come mm-hmm. in and, and chat with us and tell their story and, and, and give us some insight on this 12 team. Jonathan Hassler joined us earlier in the year, obviously Ryan Blaney, who helped us celebrate our 100th episode earlier this mm-hmm. season, mm-hmm. seeing him celebrate a NASCAR cup series championship, seeing the Blaney family, Dave, Lisa, Emma, Aaron, who was talked about so much through this week because of her connections to William mm-hmm. Byron is, you know, yeah. a fellow competitor of Ryan's for this championship. Um, I mean, seeing Dave smile photo that Jeff Gluck posted of Dave kind of watching from the back of the, the room in the media center as Ryan's mm-hmm. doing is it just, it, it took me back to all those days. And I, I made a, uh, you know, a really heartfelt post as our main, what I would call our main post on Facebook that talked about Lou and Dave and Dale and all of these longtime fans of this family, because I feel like most of us are fans of the whole family um, from them, from the women that, that, that support them. Um, it took me back to where we met the quickest lap uh, mm-hmm. forum days, the, the race chat room from back in the days. I was even, you know, kind of dug up. There's still a little group on Facebook for, for quickest lap alums that I would say, um, all those folks that when I was a young fan of Dave, you know, that we interact with back then, you know, it's just said, you know, this championship, Ryan reaching the pinnacle of motorsports in America, this is for everybody that, that stuck behind Dave back then and had the best fun that we could have celebrating a top five here and there celebrating a top 10, as if it was almost a victory stuck it out. And he, he brings along his son, Ryan Blaney, who, you know, in just 10 or 12 years time and NASCAR national series is, is a, is a champion of the sport. And um, it was hard not to, to get too emotional and and, um, we'll play a clip too, where Ryan talks about his emotions kind of getting the best of them, but I just cannot, (laughs) it's, it's almost feel like I'm still in shock. Like I do kind of feel like at some point I'm kind of, I am going to have a little bit more of an excited jumping up and down celebration. Um, I think just seeing the, the photos, uh, him of him with the trophy and everything afterwards. Um, I tried my best. I did listen to the teardown, but I haven't listened to anybody else or really read too much into it. Cause I wanted to make sure we kind of came into this show fresh and had our own mm-hmm. opinions that weren't influenced by anybody else. So mm-hmm. um, much like when I've watched my other favorite sports teams, win, I'm going to consume all of the content possible. And I'm, I'm hope for the, those that have been listening uh, all year long and for all three years that we've been doing this podcast, that we're also going to be part of that um, celebration that all the fans out there of, of Ryan Blaney and team 12 and team Penske uh, we're uh, we're celebrating right alongside you. So we talked a lot about some of these clips from these post-race uh, press conferences that they had all night long that um, I watched while we patiently waited for tech to finish, which seemed yeah. like forever. I'm filling up my fanatics cart with t-shirts and hats, and I'm afraid to push the button on buying it until I know for sure uh, that they've passed tech. You have to remember um, that they have to do an engine teardown with the Xfinity and truck series. They actually waited a day to do that. But with the cup series, I think they, you know, want to get it all done in one night, let everybody know there's a point in the night when Bob Pockris, you know, is getting asked about tech. And he, he says um, they're still in the middle of the engine teardown, but Blaney is doing interviews. So that's a good sign. 
<laughs> so um i know we had our friend justin bosch there was was called in as a backup hauler driver mm-hmm. um i think to uh to that so that way i think the the regular hauler drivers might have a chance to celebrate and imbibe a little bit um mm-hmm. said he was our good luck charm i was so close to trying to pick up the phone and call him and ask mm-hmm. him to hey can you help speed this process along so <laughs> um spoiler alert they passed tech and then ryan blaney as you said is a 2023 champion here's what he had to say about that final run and uh the pit stop and the track position and what he had to do to go out and win the race we didn't really have a bad pit stop those guys just had lightning fast stops and um you know it's it's like man well that kind of stinks, but then you just immediately shift to, all right, this is the task. Like, this is my new job. This is what we have to do. And I think getting around getting around the 24 early was huge, right, to where I didn't have to pass two of them. It just let me set my, set my sights on Kyle um, and was able to get a pretty good run there and um, get to his outside when he got to the apron. It looks like he got – he almost spun out getting to the apron trying to – not let me get to his bottom and and i thought we were gonna possibly wreck off a two but um it was tight but no it's just you know hard racing between two guys i have a ton of respect for kyle um and so it's fun to race him for the you know the championship like that yeah so kind of some of the things we echoed in our race recap there the fact that he lost that track position wasn't super upset because he understood the position that they were in but it actually gave him an opportunity to focus forward. That's kind of one of the things, one of the Penske catchphrases that they talk about every year and focus on what that next mission was going to be. Luckily he gets past the 24 quickly and then sets his sights on the, on the five car going forward. So anything to, to add to that clip? No, I mean, you know, he, he explained it pretty well. They, you know, they, uh, you know, the focus forward thing is really, really the coolest thing and like i said earlier about like sometimes josh would say uh, you know get a drink right now you know same type of thing just kind of reset and you know this is something we talked about uh, as a team you know that you know uh, overcoming adversity you know it happens these things happen and how do you respond to them how do you show your character uh, and what do you do uh when the pressure's on you to take care of business and he definitely explained that really well there when the pressure was off, Ryan had a little bit more fun in the media center. Um, and it, we saw a little bit of a spicy Ryan the last couple of, uh, so after he won after Martinsville, uh, when, when he was asked about, you know, his lucky streak during the playoffs, he didn't really like that too much. Mm-hmm. And here he's talked, he's been asked about the the contact with Ross Chastain and whether it was intentional or not. And I know this has been played on social media all over the place because it's pretty funny, but uh, here's Ryan's take on that contact and the hard racing with Chastain and, and why um, he did what he did. Well, f***ing right. I hit him on purpose. <laughs> I mean, yeah, yes. I hit him on purpose. He blocked me on purpose 10 times. So yeah, I hit him on purpose. <laughs> I mean, what do you expect me to do? He's backing me up to the, the other championship guy and I got to go. I mean, we were just racing hard, but did I think he was over excessive on the blocks? Yes, very much so. And yes, did I hit him? Yes, I did. But that's just part of it. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that kind of encapsulated how we felt uh, in that moment. Mm-hmm. But it did. And we talked about this in the recap. It stressed me out because I was concerned that this was a mistake, that racing Ross was a mistake. Racing him so hard was a mistake, especially trying to punt him there. Man, I was like, in the in the moment, I wasn't sure that was so great. Um, but luckily between Josh and Jonathan and another fellow, um, there's a lot of calming voices that could help Ryan kind of mm. refocus there and throughout the race. And we see this mostly after the IndyCar season is over. Roger Penske is at the track a lot. You mentioned it earlier that he got on the radio a few times. He was on the radio and usually it's usually just during stage breaks, but there's points in this race where Ryan or Roger got on the radio while the race was actively going on here. And uh, Roger was kind of asked about that uh, communication uh, in the media center following the the victory. Well, I guess other than the spotter, I have the right to give him a couple shots one way or the other. I think that, uh, you know, he was running fine. I think a little bit, uh, he was, uh, you know, concerned that he was being backed up by the one 
you know, obviously to, to the five, which he really wasn't. But uh, it just com- calming him down. He was doing a great job. Uh, the guys, uh, Jonathan, the team, good pit stops, good strategy on getting that car right. It was, it's more to say, hey, you're doing a great job. I told him before the race, win, lose, or draw, you're a champion. Love that comment. And um, you can't. You can't tell Roger Penske what to do or what not to do. And I think you mentioned Ryan's <laughs> not going to argue with them. There's been a couple of times in this playoff run where Roger's kind of come on and said some things that I'm like, maybe Ryan doesn't want to hear at that at moment. But I do think, you know, he hears the captain in his ear. Um, he knows that he's in his corner. And like he said, he told him before the race even started, you know, no matter what happens today, you're you're a champion. And I think that was that was really important for him to hear. Um, mm-hmm. Were you concerned at all about, you know, the boss coming on when he or Ryan already has Jonathan in his ear and Josh in his ear and anybody else? No, no. He kind of picked his spots um, from, from what I'm hearing and what I've heard uh, in the past, even he kind of picked his spots and came on at the right moment with the right thing to say. Um, Some things that really, you know, Josh doesn't necessarily have the time to deal with, you know, Josh is not your cheerleader. Josh is definitely your facts guy and trying to give you uh, info, you know, but Roger come on once or twice to just tell him, you know, you're not the only one having a problem. Everyone's having a problem. And not in a way that like was being mean to him or not. It was just like, Hey, you know, you don't worry, you know, don't worry as much, you know, everybody's fighting what you're fighting, um, you know, and you're fighting it better than ever anybody else. Uh, that's the, you know, so he, he gave those kind of encouraging things and uh, uh, yeah, it was always at the right moment. One other thing that I really think helped Ryan kind of battle through this moment and rise to the occasion on such a grand stage in the sport was the winless season last year, which, I mean, they did win the all-star race. I feel like was really important for the growth of this 12 team. And we might not have seen that as it was happening, um, but the mistakes and issues that he had in the playoffs last year, I think definitely helped him during this playoff run and getting through the frustrating parts of the, of this race. And uh, he had some thoughts on, on kind of leaning on what he learned in the the playoff run last year. We had a good shot to get here last year and and I made mistakes, you know, at at Vegas and Miami that kept us out. And, um, you know, that was, that was pretty brutal, um, you know, for me, for our whole group, right. Whenever you, or the one personally making those mistakes, you know, you take it the harshest, right? But, um, you know, everyone on the 12 group supported me really well, and we just kind of set into, hey, what do we need to do to get better, right? Where are the areas we need to get better? And, and we did that over the off season, and was able to get here this year. So um, I think we learned a lot from last year from multiple sides. Yeah, this is something I've said before. A um, couple things, you know, his humility there to actually – just come out and say that, you know, those things happened last year were on him. You know, how many drivers would really say that kind of stuff? You know, a lot of these guys are try to be type A personalities, even when they're not. Um, but for him to realize, recognize, and then overcome it, then learn from it and overcome it and um, treat the team guys the same way. You know, the, the people, <laughs> we're not going to go totally negative, but the people who make statements about, well, the team did this wrong or the team did that wrong. um, You know, these guys, these guys um, are human too, and they do make mistakes. But the thing is, is, you know, they learn from it, they get better and hopefully start to, you know, perform at an even higher level. And everybody, you know, on that whole team 12 did that, you know, and, and, you know, Ryan recognizes that as well as anybody else. And, you know, he rose to the occasion. Everybody else rose to the occasion. It was really, really good to see that, uh, you know, everybody could grow together and mature together, you know, in the right direction. Now, one other obstacle, all of Team Penske, and for what many people thought was all of Ford Motor Company, or at least the Ford drivers in the Cup Series had to to get over was a speed issue. They made some changes to the nose early in the season. They thought that was going to help their handling and overall speed in the car, uh, but they really kind of struggled out of the gate, and we didn't see this 12-team win until the Coca-Cola 600, which oddly enough, was that a track that you really did have to have really great handling and speed at. So Ryan kind of was asked about this in in the post race about whether he was concerned during that summer slump, I'll call it, um, that they would ever actually get over that hump and find the speed that they needed to make a championship run. 
you know, when, when, uh, RFK started running well, you know, Busher won those three races, Brad started running really good. It's like, all right, well it's there, you know, it's the speed and the Fords are out there. These guys found it. We, what are we missing? Um, well, we took that as a challenge, you know, okay. These guys have figured out a way to, to make what we thought was an uncompetitive car winning cars. So we can't blame that anymore. So let's just go to work. Um, so I, I didn't really ever have that thought in the summer months, even when we were struggling, right? You just, you just try to do the best you can of giving information on where we need to be better, whether that's from an engine side, aero side, you know, setup side, you just try to do the work and, and you understand that this sport, you're going to be, you know, on top for a little while. And then other teams are going to find something. You're going to go to the bottom for a little while. You just have to have to keep working hard. And, and that's what I love about this group is, is they don't ever, you know, get down on themselves. They just do the work and they just figure it out. And, and um, that's what they did. And you know, so I never had a doubt in them. I mean, it was, there was a lot of tough conversations. It's like, Hey, we gotta, we gotta do something or we're not going to be competitive at all in the playoffs. And, and everyone jumped on the opportunity to, to dig down deep and, and that's what they did and wound up here. Yeah. I mean, we may never know exactly what the things were, but uh, the definitely the last five, six weeks of the year here, uh, so they found something. <laughs> they found something that got them back to being the top forward on the track. And then by being that top forward, you know, they were competitive with everybody else. Yeah. And Jonathan uh, Hassler was asked about this well, like as well, like what did they do to find the speed? And it doesn't really have a ton of insight into it, but he kind of echoes Ryan's statements when he says, you know, kind of they put their head down, they went to work and uh, they eventually found it. And it definitely helped them, uh, get to the championship race and, and ultimately win. So here's what kind of he said about what they were able to tweak when it came to set up things and, and just to find speed in this race car that they thought at the beginning of the year, um, they weren't going to be able to find. You know, speaking to the the development through the year, um, you know, it's really not one area area. Um, you know, there's a, a lot of little things that you can do to these cars and you got to make the right decision on each one of those little things along the way. And, you know, I think the, the adage is, you know, um, pennies make, uh, you know, nickels, nickels make dimes, dimes make, uh, you know, dollars. And, and you just kind of stack all those things up and, and try to put the, the best piece together you can at the end of the day. Whoa, 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 whoa. This isn't stacking pennies here, but that's the sentiment. That's the sentiment that he had. And you basically, that's oh. they are in such a small box with this next gen car. And it really can be just the tiniest thing that, that could put them over the hump and, and give them that advantage, advantage when it comes to their competitors. Well, I'm, unlike stacking pennies, uh, he's talking about the next level. Once you've stacked enough pennies, that you've <laughs> went to the to the bigger bigger denomination. Yeah. Um, but uh, you know, this man does not get enough credit for what he's done in two short years. Um, once again, not going to get into a lot of negative with people online, but you give people time to show what they can do and put them put things together. And, uh, you know, there might be something in one of Ryan's comments later if they talk about him or maybe you don't have it, but where he talks about um, the leadership that the, that the man showed coming from a background of engineering. But on the other hand, engineering is something that was totally important with this next generation car to have a guy who knew what to do with it. And, um, you know, it just does not get enough credit uh, for what he pulled off this year. So one thing we we joked about, especially after Martinsville, and we knew, uh, or actually especially after Joey was knocked out of the playoffs, is this wingman thing. It, it, it comes up because we talked about Roger being on the radio. That was something that was said to Ryan over the radio during this Phoenix Championship race last year that – um, from Roger Penske that that mentioned this wingman scenario and you know Ryan has to be a good teammate and um when they're searching for this speed where they're searching for great setups for these especially the round of eight in this championship race um Roger and Jonathan talk about the importance of having Joey Logano and Austin Cindric as teammates and what their philosophy was what their strategy was and how to use those two teammates in practice in simulation um, to help move the 12 car forward. And I kind of thought this was interesting, the insight that they gave on this and how those two uh, our two wingmen <laughs> helped us out. And even Harrison Burton, to some extent, in the 21 car as well. 
Well, I think number one, we knew what we had to do to have, he's in the championship final four. So when we came to the racetrack the last several, several weeks, everybody came the same way. So we had an opportunity, you know, and then they had a certain element that they had to test on their car because, you know, there's very little testing, very little practice. And I think that went into the notebook. And then Jonathan could take the plus and the minus, whether, whether it was tire pressures, whether it was aero, whether it was springs or shocks. We had that ability to get that from really the three drivers plus what Harrison was doing. So to me, I think then that was key for you, wasn't it? Yeah, I agree entirely with, you know, Roger's assessment there. It was just, uh, you know, making sure we show up the same, um, you know, picking the, the highlights uh, really from, from my list of, of kind of the things that I think we need to work on and, and get answers to and, and try to answer those questions and then put our best foot forward for the race. Kind of makes me wonder how that worked for Hendrick. So they have two cars that ended up in the championship four. Do you think the five and the 24 were really sharing all their notes? Uh, maybe they were. Maybe that's something that, that Jeff and Chad made them do. But it, when it came to uh, Team Penske, and I know the fans were calling for this, all assets, all resources needed to be put behind this 12 car to get it to win a championship. And it sounds like that's kind of the approach that they took. Yeah, it, uh, you know, from practice to qualifying, to hear that about the practice especially – uh, was really, really interesting to understand that that's actually what they were doing because I will watch practice times and was looking at what the other cars were doing to kind of see, especially Joey, because Joey's, you know, already been a champion a couple times over. And, you know, how did that 22 do? Uh, what did they do? And if the, you know, practice times were comparable, maybe that they would change something in the 12 car, you know, so. Yeah, it was definitely interesting to hear it from the straight from the horse's mouth, basically on on what they were doing, and uh, it definitely worked out for him. So Ryan talked about this as well that um, there's not many things that you can do uh, that's a first for Roger Penske. Yeah, you know, he's won. I think this is his 44th National Series championship between IndyCar and NASCAR. Um, so many accomplishments, so many Indianapolis 500s. People have already won the Daytona 500 for him. Uh, but what he's never done before in the Cup Series is have back-to-back -back championships. And Ryan was able to deliver that. So Roger talks a little bit about that and also uh, what they did with Ford to find some speed and make this championship run possible. You know, back-to-back -back shows the strength of our organization. We really weren't that strong in the middle part of the season. But as Jonathan and the engineering team, along with Ford, helped us get better and better. And you can see how well the Fords ran even here today. And I think uh, it was a combination of many things. But for me personally, that's what we're here for. We love the competition. We, we love the stress. But also we like a day to sit down here like this and say we're champions. Got to love to hear that mm -hmm. uh, sentiment from the captain for sure. And you mentioned uh, Jonathan and Ryan's uh, working relationship, how they both work hard, how Jonathan might not get as much credit as he should and um, Roger kind of talks about that relationship and uh, how they put those two guys together and how it's grown into uh, what it is today. And uh, the fact that they're, they're both standing there as, as both uh, cup champions. So here's what Roger had to say about that pairing. Blaney's learned how to win over the last couple of months. You've seen that. And I think he's matured to be a champion. And when you see guys like Kyle Larson and you see Elliot come up to him in that, winner circle and congratulate him you know he's he's a key guy in that garage area and he'll set a lot of standards you know for the other drivers coming up and to me uh, he showed how good he is today to everybody not just our team and Jonathan myself but when you think about Jonathan coming with us here really had been with us a long time and having the chance to take that step up he said look you and Blaine are going to get together they didn't know but they've been a tremendous you know combination and I think that's what we have at Indy too Yeah. So you mentioned a little bit earlier about Ryan's thoughts on Jonathan Hassler. And you, you said he didn't want to get into the negatives, but there are plenty of people, especially last year when they went winless. And this year, the first half of the year before the Coke 600, that kind of questioned his leadership or questioned his strategy. And, you know, he's kind of like the head coach of a team. And, you know, we're fans of NFL teams and stuff. It's really easy to point blame at the head coach and say, ah, oh, you know, we need a new guy, get him out of here, find somebody else. Um, you never want to blame the players too often. And I, I can say as far as Blaney fans go, you're, they're very quick to defend Ryan when it comes to anything here. Um, but I feel like you and I in this podcast have been 
big fans of Jonathan Hassler and we knew what he had in him. And uh, here's what Ryan thinks about his Team 12 crew chief. Hassler's been fantastic. I mean, he's he's such a good guy, and he and I's personality are pretty similar. Um, so when, you know, Todd Gordon told me he was retiring after 2021, it's like, uh, you know, they gave me a lot of kind of leeway to pick, you know, who I wanted. Um, and, and Jonathan, I had my eye on because he crew chiefed the 21 car for the last half of the year in 21 and did a great job, and he's been around Penske for a long time. And, um, you know, he and I just, just kind of went out one night and had dinner and, and just talked. And um, I, I really enjoyed how our conversations went and our personality meshed. And I knew he was a smart guy. And um, being able to work with him through the winter, you know, of 21 into the new car, uh, he's done a fantastic job. And, you know, he was an engineer. So it's it's hard to go from an engineering role straight into crew chiefing. You know, you're you're managing and you're leading 15 guys. And, um, you're trying to keep them pumped up and you're, you know, also think about setups with the engineers. You're trying to pump up the pit crew guys. You're trying to tell the mechanics what to do. It's like that role is tough to jump into. And um, it took him a little while to kind of get comfortable with that. But this year, it's kind of like what, you know, internally I went to myself last year of what I can do better. He and I had the talks of like, hey, what, what can we both do better to make this uh, more of a leadership role and for you to get more comfortable? And, and he embraced it. He's been fantastic to, to our whole group, and um, gosh, it's been fun. been fun to work with him. He's just an awesome guy and, and cool to uh, have a really fun year with him. Yeah, we've, you know, we've gotten to know, uh, you know, a bunch of these guys, and Jonathan has been uh, key to that, actually. Uh, we, you know, he's been very good and generous with us. Um, but that's what we kind of like wanted to tell people as the years this year went on is get to know some of these guys, get to know what they were doing because they were, they were working toward working hard, working toward a goal and his leadership, uh, was showing that. And, uh, you know, when it all comes culmination like this, uh, it, it's really, really special. Uh, and it, you know, by getting to know them, it really makes you feel, uh, really happy for them as a group, you know, uh, the, the team. Like it's a team period, 12 period that, you know, he put that together. That's his thing. And, he, you know, and, and that's his stamp on things. And, uh, you know, his stamp is now, uh, you know, on that cup too. Another person that, uh, another special person that I think we're really happy for, proud of, and that's Dave Blaney. And when Ryan got to team Penske and especially when he got to the cup series, Ryan's kind of said that Dave kind of stepped back a little bit. He still calls him after every race. I think that's his first phone call, but he's not as hands-on as maybe he was when he was getting him up through the ranks, getting him that ride with Tommy Baldwin, uh, maybe some of his truck and Bush uh, uh, nationwide series at the time and Xfinity series runs. But when he's spoken about his dad, Dave, during this playoff run, he has said he's been one of his biggest motivators. I don't even want to say a cheerleader, a motivator that's trying to put him in the right mindset to see a path forward. And Ryan talked about uh, how much Dave stepped up during this this playoff run and uh, kept him uh, focusing forward and has eyes on that championship. He's been awesome, right? I mean, he's been uh, uh, not only someone I grew up, you know, wanting to be like and wanting to, you know, do his sport, uh, you know, obviously getting me started in, in racing, supporting me along the way, opened a lot of doors for me. Um, and then for him to still be, you know, supportive, uh, you know, when I'm an adult is, is great. So he's been, you know, he, he went on, uh, you know, his whole thing was like through the playoffs was, you know, I see the path, you know, I can see the path to the championship. I can see it. And uh, after we won Martinsville, he's like, it's lit up now. The path is lit up, and uh, I think we drove through the gate tonight, so <laughs> we have arrived. So it's just cool to have my whole family here, which was uh, very special. Dave was asked, uh, I think by Jordan Bianchi and some other folks after this race, like, did you see it in Ryan Blaney as a young or as a driver that he could someday win the Cup Series championship? And Dave said pretty quickly, I, that he saw it when he was about 14 years old. He said he saw he had the talent. He saw he had the drive. Um, it was just going to take more than that to to make it happen. So that's kind of, uh, you know, from a guy like Dave, that's, you know, accomplished a lot in his racing career, still winning on dirt tracks and in sprint cars at, at a high level part-time. Um, 
I know it's his son, but that was some really encouraging words and really some confidence that maybe he was able to instill in Ryan to help him out through this run. Yeah. At uh, the, you know, the post race, uh, you know, when we were looking at people, when we saw the whole family up on stage there, uh, you know, that, that was a moment because when you talked earlier about how we've been following them all along and I say following them and we were talking about the family, we're talking about, you know, Dave and Lisa and, and then all the kids, you know, and being at the track on a Saturday night on a dirt track somewhere, watching him race all the way to, you know, this level with his, his, his son now and uh, his sisters get to be there with him. Um, you know, it just, it just made the whole night it brought, brought a, put a bow on everything basically, you know. And beyond Dave, Ryan had a little bit more to talk about his, his whole family and kind of where he stands now in that Blaney racing family legacy bringing in a little bit of asphalt and asphalt championship into a family that's found most of their success on dirt. No, it's fantastic. You know, I mean, just coming from a, a racing family in general, right. Uh, you know, grandfather Lou went in a bunch, you know, championships around, uh, you know, the, the Northeast and, um, you know, dad went in being the outlaw champion, um, you know, Dale went in the all-star championship. And, and now for me to, to kind of, add some asphalt into there is is pretty good because that's what i grew up doing but i mean i couldn't think of a better spot of my family being here and, and they may be able to witness it because you know they they are just as much a part of it as i am and not only my dad my mom sacrificed more than you could imagine to make sure i could get to every race and and do what i needed to do to to get going and and i have two awesome sisters that, that support me so uh it's uh it's pretty special to have them here yeah, absolutely. Class act family all around. And he mentions his sisters, uh, Emma and Aaron, who have both been uh, guests on the podcast in the past, talking about foundation uh, events and things like that. And yeah, Lisa, I know, you know, Dave was out running in the cup series as Ryan was coming up through the ranks. And she's the one that was making sure he was getting to the track every week, getting his legend car out there, his quarter midget, uh, everything he needed to do to keep progressing through those early stages of his racing career. So um, all of the, the Blaney women, Kate Blaney back there in, in Hartford, Ohio, uh, great woman, uh, great boss out there at Sharon Speedway for me during my years there um, class acts all around. And, you know, we can't be more proud to, to cheer and support uh, a family like the Blaney family. And um, this week with the stories that have come out, what they talked about on the race broadcast, it's really cool to see that millions of people, know more about their story and about their legacy and uh what do you think uh you know ryan it's always been that misconception and we talked to him about it on our show when we interviewed ryan earlier this year um you know he's not a dirt guy everyone thinks he's a dirt guy um but i think uh this this asphalt you know little asphalt championship is is good for that whole family's legacy what do you think yeah it it might work out for him you know i i I don't know i don't know if his dad and his uncle look at him you know quite the same though they probably both you know, like sooner or later, you're going to have to do some dirt. <laughs> <laughs> I'm okay with holding off on that for a little bit longer. Yeah. We're okay. We talked about our emotions in those closing laps of the race. And um, Ryan mentioned it a few times. He's not really an emotional guy. He says he's not an emotional guy yet. It's Coke 600, Talladega, um, even a little bit in that Martinsville win, especially in his, his interview here. Um he seems like he's becoming a little bit of an emotional guy. I think some of that's fighting this adversity and, mm-hmm. and silencing the doubters and the Kyle Petties of the world that were a little bit hard on him early in the season. So he talks about the emotions that were kind of going through in those those closing laps. And I feel like we were all with him as that was happening. I did tear up on the last lap a little bit in the helmet. Uh, just thinking about a lot of stuff. Uh, I, I was a little sobbing baby on the radio after the race. I could barely speak. Just, just, you know, just think about everything. Proud of, proud of everybody. Uh, you know, it's been a, been a long career in, in motorsports. And, uh, so yeah, I don't know, just, just kind of overcome with emotion. I mean, if you try to do something for a long time, you're, uh, overcome with it and, um, it's just kind of part of it. So now do you want to hear? what he's talking about when he's been a, was being a, a sobbing baby as he crossed the line. Cause I do have that audio pulled up. There's going to be a little bit of engine noise here, but I think you'll, you'll get the picture. And then my favorite part of this audio is when, you know, they have the series director coming on and telling Ryan that, you know, he is the cup champion. Well, it also be 
sure, man. Thank you so much. Can always celebrate with you guys. RP, Grant, thanks for giving me a shot. Congrats to everybody. That's so cool, man. Hell of a job, driver. Proud of you for sticking with it all year. Way to go, T-12. Congrats, Jonathan, everybody. Y'all deserve it, man. So cool. Brian Blaney, you got a copy? Yeah. Congratulations, buddy. Great job, you, Jonathan, the entire team. 2023 NASCAR Cup Series champion. Come on out, celebrate, and start finish line for us, buddy. Great job, team. He burned it down again. Second time this year. Wasn't sure if he was going to do it or not, but I think the I think he knows the fans kind of want it. And um, mm. the, I thought the burnout at Talladega was big. Mm. Man, uh, you you <laughs> think that this guy had been practicing practicing this a lot, but you know, outside of maybe burnouts on the Boulevard and that Talladega one, he hasn't really done it too much. Mm-mm. But he did one heck of a burnout for those fans in Phoenix. It was pretty cool. Jumped up on top of the car, did this thing like he was waving the smoke out of his way <laughs> when it was. Uh, yeah, it was really, really cool to see. And you can't, uh, I mean, I know he has a little tradition. He can go back to it during the regular season, but uh, when it's uh, the biggest race basically of your career at this point, uh, I think you have to. <laughs> I think you kind of have to. And uh, yeah, it was a lot of emotions from us. You know, uh, he doesn't show a lot of it, but when he does, um, it, it kind of gets you emotional too, because, you know, you've been following it, we've been following it. Uh, for all these years now and uh, you know we really hope this day would come you know so it was a huge day for us a huge day for ryan and this team and he spoke really briefly on you know the momentous occasion that this was and what it would mean uh in his career going forward oh by far i mean but this tops everything right this is what you dream of as a kid this is what you strive for this is what you run 35 races a year for you know um, to get to this moment, to have a shot at the championship, and then you have to run a perfect race to, to get it. So, oh, yeah, definitely huge moment, not only for me. I mean, everybody involved in it, it's way bigger than I am, and um, I can't thank those folks enough for, for doing what they do. Now, I know I've, I've put every through this the paces of all these clips, but I feel like each one has been kind of important along the way and told a great story. And this last one from Roger Penske just might be my favorite. I think his limits are the sky, to be honest with you. I think that, uh, you know, he gets in that class, you know, with mirrors. You know, he's a soft-spoken guy, really. But when he gets behind the wheels like Joey, when he puts his hat on, don't get in his way. And I think they showed that today. And uh, he's only getting better and better. He, he's got the confidence. He's a leader. Uh, he's a winner and he's a champion. And once you have that, it's so hard to get there. I mean, I don't think any of us realize him personally, just those last 20 or 30 laps when he had to pass a couple of those guys to get the championship. You know, that shows his true, true medal. But uh, he's got a long way to go, a long way. About the fourth time I've said you'd love to hear that from the captain. And I feel like he's always had Ryan's back. He's been somebody that he's enjoyed seeing grow from a young man uh, to an adult, to a Cup Series champion. And you can just feel it, you know, they have, they have Ryan locked in on a multi-year agreement at Team Penske. And just from those words from Roger himself, it doesn't seem like they're going to let him go anytime soon. And they see that, you know, the sky's the limit. There's a ton of upside when it comes to Ryan Blaney. And hopefully this is just the first of many championships to come. Yeah, Roger, um, at one of his other press, press uh, answers, talked about the continuity at Penske. And... um that's something that you can't buy. And there are people there who have been there through the 10 years that Ryan has been there and been with Ryan most of that time. And other guys have come along, but they've built a continuity within the, within the organization. And, uh, you know, even when Fords don't look like that, they're doing very well. Uh, the Fords have won back-to-back championships out of the same company. And that's a testament to Roger and what he's put together and how he's built something for these guys to win championships. So uh, the sky's the limit, right? Can't believe it, Steve. I said it at the top. Can't believe it, but I can believe it. And uh, felt like maybe we have believed it all year long. And I just don't know. It, it We chat a little bit about before about this before the show, but I thought, you know, being a fan of Ryan, being a little bit humble, you know, I thought he's going to be a good driver. He's going to win, you know, 10, 15, 
maybe 20 races. Hopefully he gets that championship. Now that he's hoisted the trophy, I'm like, yeah, man, if he does, if he does get 10, at least 10 more races, he's going to be in the Hall of Fame, right? Can you imagine that? Ryan Blaney in the NASCAR Cup Series Hall of Fame. I think it's, I think it's possible. Hey, you know, we've already predicted a couple of things on this show in a short, short time we've been doing it. Right. Um, you know, he, he got to that 10 win mark. Um, yeah, you know, double that up, go get some more wins and, uh, you know, let's squeeze another championship or two out of this. You know, that's the, the best part about the experience is he's already experienced it now. So now you know what it takes. You know, now you know what, what the effort takes. There's a, there's an old story about uh, Wayne Gretzky when he was a young, young hockey player and they played in the, uh, the, the Stanley cup finals, like one of the first times and they lost. Okay. They lost and they went to the losers, went to the winner's locker room and saw all the guys just kind of laid out. Just, they were all like exhausted and they're all tired and all dead <laughs> basically, you know, from, from the match. And he realized from that point on, well, that's what it took. It took that kind of effort. It took that kind of uh, passion. It took whatever it took to win. And Ryan has now seen that, you know, we've had a whole season of it. We know what it looks like. We know what it takes to do it. And now uh, when, you know, learning from that experience, uh, you know, duplicating it, you know, it is a definite possibility because now you know what it takes to do it. So as we speak, Ryan was making his way out to New York City. New York City um, champion always goes on a bit of a media tour. He's probably going to do several morning shows. He'll probably be with people like Barstool Sports doing lots of other social media engagement and um, probably touring that trophy around the city and beyond. So that's going to be his next few days. Uh, so if you want to keep this thing rolling, follow along all of his social media channels. And I'm sure NASCAR is going to be pumping out a lot of content when it comes to that. Um, if you want to continue the celebration, the NASCAR award ceremony is set for Thursday, November 30th at Music City Center in Nashville, Tennessee. That uh, broadcast, I don't know the exact time yet, but it's usually in the evening, 6 or 7 p.m., it's going to be broadcast live on the radio only MRN Sirius XM NASCAR radio. They'll broadcast live during that event. So you can hear it that night, November 30th. That's a Thursday. The TV broadcast is going to be tape delayed until 7 p.m. Eastern time on Sunday, December 3rd. And it's on everybody's favorite uh, streaming channel. Uh, peacock so unfortunately for those of you that want to tune into that you're most likely going to have to have a peacock peacock subscription um so but if you do also have uh access to mrn i think they have their own streaming app if you have access to sirius xm nascar radio you're going to be here you're going to be able to hear that whole event live on thursday night but if you want to watch a video version of that it looks like you're going to have to wait until december 3rd at 7 p.m and watch that on peacock and uh that will pretty much wrap up that uh, cup series championship run for Ryan Blaney, Steve, one other really awesome thing when it comes to media that we should talk about briefly is the fact that Ryan Blaney's whole championship run here. This whole playoffs has been documented by NASCAR productions as they're working in turn with Netflix to do a documentary mm -hmm. series, similar to what they did last year on USA. This time will be on Netflix. I think it's going to have a little bit more of that formula one drive to survive vibe than maybe last year's episodes had with that USA network special. So um, how cool is it that Ryan wins his first cup series championship and pretty much forever, we're going to be able to go back and relive that race to race to race because they're doing this documentary series. Yeah. It's um, you know, that's going to be really, really cool. Um, I don't, I had Netflix. I probably get it back just for that. Um, but uh, Hey, the Netflix people should be calling us. I told you this the other day. I was like, uh, we're the, we're the Bible on this whole thing. We're the definitive, uh, you know, week to week, uh, we chronicled everything that just happened all the way through this uh, season with the highs, the lows, the different things, the little behind the scenes things that happened during a race. Um, you know, uh, if you ever get bored this winter and you want to go back and listen to a bunch of uh, episodes or just pick out your favorites, you know, pick out the wins. A lot of people like to listen to the wins, you know, but, uh, yeah, the, uh, the, truthfully, I'm just kidding around. I mean, Netflix is going to do a, a fabulous job with this, and uh, I can't wait to see it and uh, and see what they uh, – because uh, we've seen the cameraman following Ryan around yeah. at, the at the tracks like crazy. So 
um, they knew who to follow. That's for sure. And I uh, can't wait to see what happens. So to wrap this thing up, let's take a look at the top 10 in the NASCAR cup series standings after the race at Phoenix raceway, the finale in the NASCAR cup series season, Ryan Blaney's your winner. First position, NASCAR Cup Series champion. Second, Kyle Larson. Third, William Byron. Fourth, Christopher Bell. Obviously, they just fall in line as they finish the race at Phoenix with Bell finishing fourth after he had that brake rotor failure. In the fifth position, Denny Hamlin. Sixth, Tyler Reddick. Seventh, Chris Buescher. Eighth, Brad Keselowski. Ninth, the race winner from Sunday, Ross Chastain. And I think this is a big deal. Tenth position, Bubba Wallace. Um, straight up in points, they're battling there those last couple races to get in that 10th position. And he actually bypasses Martin Truex Jr., who was the regular season champion, to get that 10th spot. So notable things there. The 45 and 23, both 2311 cars finish in the top 10 in the standings. The 17 and 6 finish 7th and 8th, both RFK cars finish in the top 10 in the standings. So talk about Ford having some struggles over the season. You still got three out of the 10 our Ford, uh, Ford vehicles, Ford Mustang. So um, congratulations to all those folks that finished in the top 10, but obviously our big congratulations goes to Ryan Blaney, Jonathan Hassler, all of team 12, all of team Penske, all the men and women back at the shop, anybody, anybody involved with that team. Congratulations. I know they're going to have some pretty big celebrations this week and into the future. And uh, at some point though, Jonathan will tell you, they have to focus on 2024 mm-hmm. and um, who knows, who knows how long their, their celebrations will last. They might get off on a vacation a little bit, but they're really soon going to have to hit the ground running. And as far as I know, December, I don't know who's going to it. Maybe not Blaney, but there's going to be a test back there at Phoenix raceway uh, with this next gen car and some other things they want to adjust with the short track package. So that's going to bring them back to reality really, really fast. And uh, as far as I know from today, it's only like 104 or so days until the Daytona 500. That's not a long time, and it's going to be here uh, before you know it. And they're also, remember, the Clash of the Coliseum is going to happen too, and that's going to happen a couple weeks before. So um, short off season, but hopefully it feels like a long time to soak in this championship win by Ryan Blaney. I told you I filled up my Fanatics uh, cart last night and uh, – gave my uh, credit card a pep talk like Roger Penske gave a pep talk to Ryan to make sure it could handle what was coming its way. But uh, as it's been with any time I've had a team or a a sports, uh, yeah, sports team franchise, somebody that's found some success, won a championship. I have to have all the things and try and remember it. But like you said, um, thankfully we have the memories of every single episode that we've done this year on the podcast and all the people that we've interviewed and uh, chronicled it the whole way through. And we'll be able to keep this forever we do have some housekeeping to do and that involves the team blaney nascar fantasy live league i think it's worth mentioning who our champion is who our playoff champion is and where we finished out the season um my lineup which i forgot until about five minutes before the green flag to set my lineup so i got it in right under uh right under the the deadline there um, my team started Ryan Blaney, Kyle Larson, William Byron, Martin Truex Jr., Denny Hamlin, had Joey Logano in the garage. I'm realizing that maybe that wasn't the best idea because I don't think they gave those guys. I thought they would give them the stage points just based on where they finished, but they didn't. <laughs> so um, so I really only was getting 30. I mean, Truex, who was out of it and did get stage points, got me the most. So it got me 41 points. Ryan got me 35, Larson 34, Byron 33. Hamlin 29. And again, Truex got me 41. I picked Ryan over Larson. That was right in the featured matchups. I picked Byron over Bell. That was right. I picked Hamlin over Logano. That was right. And I picked Harvick over Reddick. And that was right. So I swept the featured matchups. Um, but yeah, it wasn't a great strategy, I guess, to pick the championship four. So I ended up finishing 22nd with 162 points or 212 points earned uh, with just 10 stage points coming via Martin Truex Jr. and Denny Hamlin. So um, what did your lineup look like? Did you do the same thing as me? Did you forget? How did that go? Yeah, I had I had Truex, Logano, Harvick, Kozlowski, and Elliott uh, with the Gibbs in the garage. So You were smarter than I. I, yeah, I, I, I read the disclaimer that was at the top of the page that said that. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't have time to read. I was frantically <laughs> trying to make my picks because I was dumb and forgot. <laughs> I, I had Ryan over Larson. I had Byron over Bell, so I got those right. I had Logano, unfortunately, with Hamlin. And then I did have Harvick over uh, Reddick. So, um, you know, 
uh, pretty good points today. Harvick was second most in points and Truex was fourth most in points. You know, I, I uh, didn't really research much. I just tried to make sure I had some guys who could start and uh, you know, weren't in the, in the final four. Cause I wanted those stage points. So. So let's take a look at the top 10 in points earned at Phoenix Raceway. And we have a one, two, three, four way tie for 10th with my wife Rogers T with 223 points, Factory of Sadness six, and Bulldog 0277 in the Prime Minister three. Again, in the 10th position, all with 223 points earned. Ninth is Pocono Lady 225. Eighth is Fike 21, 226. Uh, the defending champion, Clad's Chicken Pit Racing, in seventh in points earned at Phoenix, 230. Six is Van 12 at 220 or 231. Fifth is Joe Lopez, one, 233. Fourth is Zero Schlitz, given 242. Third, JD Racing, 243. Second, Dr. Race Chaser, shout out to him, 249. And winning the weekend at Phoenix, Whip Wilson in the number one position, 255 points earned. Now the playoff standings that mean nothing. And I stress this every week that it means nothing. And uh, I'll go through why that's important here. 10th position, the nutty gamer, 2023 points. Ninth, Moose Hunter, 1960, 2028. Eighth, Blaney or Bust, 2031. Seventh, congrats to me, Team Blaney host Adam, 2036. Sixth, the defending champ again, Clyde's Chicken Pit Racing, 2039. Fifth, Blaring Idiots, 2048. Fourth, Zero Schlitz Given, 2056. Third, JD Racing, 2069. Second, Fike 21, 2090. And my wife, Rogers T, wins the playoff standings. First position, 2,108 points earned. She wins it by 18 points over Fike 21 in second. I finished seventh. And you fell down the leaderboard a bit. You were in the top 10 for a little bit while in the playoffs, but now you ended up finishing 45th. Mez 12, 1,000. 828 points but here is where it all matters and where i didn't have a chance 30th position team blaney host adam 6645 not shocked steve i'm not shocked that i did not contend third year in a row here was not in contention fell a little bit i was a little bit um cocky last week i think i was up into the 20s but Knock me back down a peg here. 30th. Where did you finish? Oh, so close. 27th position, Mez 12, 6,679 points. Oh, I closed the gap. But I didn't get you. Congratulations to you. You win in the room. You win in the chat room here, (laughs) but that's about it. You win nothing else. Defending champion from the last two years has been defeated. Breaking news. Clyde's Chicken Pit Racing, 10th position, 6,902 points. And I must say, he rallied to get back to that 10th position. Mm -hmm. Um, Fell off the face of the earth during the summer months and uh, picked things back up again. Ninth, Eric D15, 6,949. Eighth is JD Racing, 6,970. Seventh is Alyssa Seath, 6,982. Six is Fike 21, 7,021. Seventh is Blaring Idiots, 7028. Fourth is Go Larson, 7035. Third, Penske Finn, 24, 7046. Second, Factory of Sadness, 6, 7092. First position, congratulations, goes out to Blaney's Daisy, who I believe has been playing the fantasy game with us for at least a couple of years. Blaney's Daisy, 7,127 points, is the overall champion in the Team Blaney NASCAR Fantasy Live League. Cue the lights, cue the confetti. You win. (laughs) You will win something. You just have to contact us. (laughs) Reach out to Team Blaney on Facebook, X, instagram tiktok send us a dm let us know that it's you show us a little bit of proof with a screenshot or something too um, that shows that it is indeed you blady's daisy and uh we want to send you some swag a little swag for winning the the team blady nascar fantasy live league and thank you everybody very active league this year all the way through uh sometimes you get some some points when people kind of fall off but uh, based on the the points that I have seen scored here, out of the 100 people that are eligible, about 70 folks were actively setting their lineups every single week. Halfway through the season, we still had people asking to get in. So thank you, everybody, for playing along with us. Hopefully, you, hopefully you've enjoyed our kind of brief and 
not always expert level take on fantasy racing and who you should pick, especially considering two fellows here finished 27th and 30th in the overall standings. Maybe you shouldn't listen to us. Um, but like Tony Stewart, I heat up in the playoffs, heat up in the summer, and I did that, and I finished in the top 10 in the playoffs. So pay attention to me when we get to uh, the round of 16 and beyond. You don't want to pay attention to me in the first half of the season. So again, congratulations to Blaney's Daisy. Congratulations to my wife, Rogers T., for winning the playoff championship. And uh, let's say we do this again next year, and uh, maybe one of us will contend for this championship at some point. What do you think? Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, I got to pay better attention to my lineup from now on. <laughs> <laughs> I messed up a couple of different things this year for sure. Well, Steve, I think that pretty much wraps up this championship edition of the Team Blaney podcast. Like I said, I could talk about this stuff for hours. Yeah. We did. I know this is a pretty long episode, so if you're still yeah. listening at this point, thanks for hanging in with us. But we really wanted to cover all the bases. I wanted to get you all of those audio clips from the post-race press conferences just in case you didn't hear them and uh, give you some insight on what was going on with that 12 team all throughout the weekend and uh, what Roger and everybody at Team Penske thinks is uh, capable, what they're capable of going forward. Yeah. Um, You know, keep an eye out on the feed. Um, You know, this will come out Tuesday morning or whatever, but keep an eye out in the future. Uh, We will try to work on having a couple guests from the championship winning uh, team or crew um, if we can. Uh, You know, we're going to, you know, we got to let them do their schedule. Uh, but at some point, somewhere along the line, I'll try to have, you know, somebody come along and hopefully be able to do a couple interviews and we can throw them up there for you, too. Yeah. And if you get bored over the off season and um, we get through some of those newer episodes that we have, go back and listen from the be- very beginning of the year where we have Dave Nichols, we have Jonathan Hassler, we have Ryan Blaney, we have Tony Palmer, we have Chris Conklin, uh, probably leaving out more people. We had Raymond the year before, you know, several members of this championship winning 12 crew have already been on with us. Ryan Blaney himself gave us, gave us a really great and long interview about halfway through the season. That is definitely a must listen for anybody that's a fan of Ryan Blaney. So thank you everyone uh, once again for tuning into this episode and all 41 other episodes of the Team Blaney podcast this year. If you'd like to learn more about myself or co-host Steve, just listen to our very first episode that explores our Blaney racing fandom. You can interact with us on Facebook and X at Team Blaney and on Instagram and TikTok at Team Blaney. And finally, we like to encourage you to support the Ryan Blaney Family Foundation. Established in 2018, this organization supports causes like the Alzheimer's Association and UPMC Sports Medicine through fundraisers, events, and membership in the Blaney Bunch Fan Club. Shout out to Patty and Lee and everybody there. Uh, To learn more, visit ryanblaneyfamilyfoundation.org or follow them on Facebook, X, and Instagram. So, for my co-host Steve Mez... I'm Adam Rogers. We'll catch you next time right here on the Team Waiting Podcast. Good night, Brussels. Check out the TikTok. Uh, thanks, everybody, for coming. I hope you enjoyed it.